Welcome back. Joining me on the panel tonight is Liberal Senator for Tasmania, Jonathan Dunningham, Labor MP for Kingsford Smith in Sydney, Matt Thistlewaite, and Liberal Senator for Victoria, James Patterson. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining me tonight. I really appreciate your time. It's a busy week leading into these by-elections. Um, I'm just going to start, Matt Thistlewaite. I'm sorry to do this to you. You're the Labor guy there, so you're going to get pinged. Um, but Emma Husser, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I've spoken about it in my editorial and uh, just before with Caroline Marcus. This is beyond now a bullying issue. It's about the misuse of taxpayer funds. I don't see it as any different from the pursuit of Barnaby Joyce over use of his staff. I don't see it as any different uh, than the pursuit over Susan Lee and the use of com cars and flights and indeed Bronwyn Bishop and helicopter flights that saw her lose the speakership. I don't think this is going to end very well for Emma Hussar. It's not something the New South Wales uh, Labor Party should be investigating into. It should be done by independent authorities in the Department of Finance. When's Labor going to bite the bullet and get finance or the independent authorities to look into this properly? Uh, well, Peter, these um, accusations have only been raised, as I understand it, um, in the last 24 hours. Uh, there is a process that is, can be used um, and is in place for the independent Parliamentary Expenses Authority to have a look at these issues. Um, there's various um, penalties that they can use if uh, there has been found that, uh, that um, someone's claimed something that they, they weren't entitled to. Um, and Emma's entitled to the presumption of innocence. So I think that, uh, you know, until we find that there's been an inquiry and until there's been any recommendations made, um, it's probably not appropriate to comment any further at this stage. Well, I agree with you that Emma Hughes is entitled to the presumption of innocence, but she hasn't fronted the camera. Uh, she hasn't put out a statement other than to say she takes leave. She hasn't dealt with any of these issues. Now, everybody else, as I said, Susan Lee, Barnaby Joyce, a Bronwyn Bishop, I could go on both sides of politics. I've got a long memory. I know plenty of them have been caught out on entitlements. Um, She's hiding from these issues and it's not going to go away and it's sucking oxygen out of the last few days of this very critical by-election campaign for Labor. Well, the issues about expenses have come up after she's applied for and been granted leave. Uh, but Emma's... you guys have had a, an inquiry, internal inquiry, sorry, Matt, for four months on this. Mustn't be much of an inquiry if this stuff has only come to light. Well, that inquiry has been conducted and we're awaiting the findings of that. Uh, and in terms of... The other issues, uh, they've come up in the last 24 hours. She was granted leave prior to that. Uh, Emma's a, a single mum uh, with three kids. I've got four kids of my own um, and I know how difficult it is uh, to raise numerous kids, particularly when, um, you know, one of the partners in that is away for half the year. Um, the fact that she's not there a lot of the time, she's in Canberra, she's trying to, to raise three young kids, it's a difficult situation Matt, for a Matt, single mum. You, you can't and spin that line with me. You know and I know exactly what happens with staff. You know and I know that people don't have their staff living with them, cleaning the kitchen, looking after their kids, picking up the dog poop. You and I both know that's not the job of uh, ministerial staff or parliamentary staff. And you and I both know that your electorate staff are supposed to serve the electorate, not do these personal jobs. Well, these are issues that are being investigated by the Labor Party through a process at the moment. And until that process has been concluded and the findings have been handed down, I'm not going to comment because I don't know what the outcome is going to be and uh, it would be presumptuous of me, as of me to do so. So I think All we right, just well need to calm down and wait until, wait until the findings come out of the inquiry. Um, then we can deal with it uh, as a party. You're then. a former party chief, so I think you and I both know where this is going to end up. It's just a matter of when and how much water Bill Shorten takes. But we'll leave it there. We'll go into other issues. We've got a by-election this weekend. John O'Dunningham, you're down in the wonderful state of Tasmania. Uh, it looks tighter and tighter, the race in Braddon. The two people contesting Braddon, Justine Key for the Labor Party and Brett Whiteley for the Liberal Party, the same two that contested it in 2016. Uh, Justine beat Brett Whiteley, who was the incumbent. He looks like he's coming back hard. Uh, polls today have it narrowly in his favour. Uh, it's an interesting race because there's a third party independent candidate who could end up being the kingmaker. Uh, at the recent state election, 
Braddon, the underlying state seats uh, underneath the federal seat of Braddon, went the Liberal Party's way. What are you hearing on the ground? Oh, look, having spent a number of days up there in Braddon, uh, people are focused on all of the issues we often speak about on this program, about jobs, power prices and, and the like. Um, with regard to uh, how close it's going to be, I think the polls are pretty accurate. It is too close to call. The fact that we're in this race, though, says a lot. Um, as we've spoken about previously, the government winning a seat back off the opposition in a by-election is uh, a fairly historic event, having only happened, uh, what, 100 years ago or thereabouts. For us to do it again here in Braddon would be a massive achievement. You mentioned uh, the independent candidate who I saw on Sky a little earlier on talking to David Spears, a fellow who thinks it's OK to uh, bash a female cop off duty uh, in the name of what he called self-defence. I mean, he's an un unbelievable character who tries to justify outrageous behaviour, behaviour he was convicted for. Um, I think he's a terrible option for the people of Braddon to vote for, and he's preferencing Labor and the Greens. And uh, I think Labor should uh, tonight rule out taking his preferences, but uh, I don't think they're going to in what is going to be a bit of a nail-biter contest, and I'm hopeful we'll see Brett Whiteley turn to the par return to the Parliament um, on Saturday. Matt Thistlewaite, last night on Alan Jones's program we had David Briggs uh, on the pollster and he was telling us that uh, Justine Key has a very high personal favourability down there in Braddon. That surprised me. I didn't think that uh, her name hadn't translated that strongly, but he said it was exceptionally strong. If she doesn't win it on the weekend, does that mean that then Bill Shorten is a drag on her vote? No, look, there's a whole host of factors that will go into these by-elections on the weekend. They're quite unusual. They're, they're Section 44 um, issues. But ultimately, people are going to vote on who they think is in their best interests. And, you know, when you, you've got a, a person like Justine who, as you say, has got a very high favourability, he's done a great job uh, as the local candidate, when they're dealing with issues such as high power prices because this government can't get its act together on electricity policy, when they're dealing with issues such as high levels of, of mortgage stress, um, when they're dealing with... Um, you know, pressure on household budgets, the fact that private health insurance is constantly going up. They're under a lot of pressure. And these are the issues that will determine the outcome of this election, these are series of elections on the weekend. They're all going to be tight um, in those particular marginal seats and we'll await the outcomes. Uh, Senator James Patterson, you're a Victorian, so you don't necessarily have a dog in this immediate race. But I'm going to ask you for your political insight here. I'll put up on the screen some AEC, Australian Electoral Commission, statistics about pre-poll. Uh, what I found quite striking is Longman, um, 22,000 people have already voted. I mean, they're very, very strong numbers. Mayo, 13,000. Uh, Braddon, 6,500. Fremantle, 4,500. And Perth, almost 5,000. Longman and Mayo... Now, Mayo uh, traditionally has always been... Uh, but for the current incumbent, Rebecca Sharkey, being a Liberal Party-held seat. They're very high numbers, but Longman is just extraordinary. Mm. You're right, Peter. It's, it's off the charts. It's extraordinarily high. And as a matter of fact, I was in Braddon uh, on Monday uh, with our fellow panellist, Jonathan Dunham, on a pre-poll booth in Braddon. And um, there was steady flow of voters, but, but not, not anything in the... In the realm of the Longman numbers. Well, one comment, Peter, I want to make about your question to Matt this way before, before about Bill Shorten's leadership is when I was at the pre-poll booth and I was handing out how-to-vote cards, our how-to-vote cards prominently and proudly featured the Prime Minister, obviously featured Brett Whiteley and the Premier of Tasmania, Will Hodgman. Uh, the Labor how-to-vote card, strangely enough, didn't, uh, I didn't notice any photos of Bill Shorten. In fact, the only photo of Bill Shorten you could see at the pre-poll booth was a negative image of Bill Shorten that was on our campaign material. So I think that shows everything you need to know. Uh, the Labor Party is hiding Bill Shorten in Braddon and the Liberal Party wants everyone in Braddon to know uh, that a vote for Justine Key is a vote for Bill Shorten. But is that a fair comment? Because I've seen plenty of footage of your leader getting around these various contests. He's certainly been in the seats. It's not the case where uh, previously, you know, Malcolm Turnbull didn't go anywhere much near WA during the state election over there. But uh, are, you, are you hiding Bill Shorten from campaign material? No, we're well, not at all. I mean, that doesn't make sense at all. He's been to these seats, particularly Longman and Braddon, twice the number of times that Malcolm Turnbull has visited. He's been throughout uh, the various suburbs and streets of these seats on numerous occasions. How can you say that we're hiding him when he's been there more than the Prime Minister's been there?
I'm I sure know. it's just an accident. He was left off the core flute and left off the how to vote card and there are no billboards of his face around town. That must have just been an oversight by the Tasmanian uh, Labor Party campaign, certainly not due to any research they're showing, uh, which would be showing the same thing our research is, that uh, Bill Shorten is a drag on Labor's vote. I just want to ask Matt Thistleway a question about Pauline Hanson too. We've seen today Pauline Hanson imagery of her in Dublin uh, off a cruise that she's had. I think the feedback from viewers and others into this, uh, this network, her supporters are saying, well, good on her for taking a break. She works very hard. Uh, it's not her fault that uh, these people couldn't get their citizenship stuff in order. Now, uh, Labor has gone very hard after Pauline Hanson. Uh, polls are saying she's got an 18% party vote. The pre-polls, from what I'm hearing from people on the various pre-poll booths, uh, they are polling very well in pre-polls. So it's looked like I'm not saying it's going to be 18%, but it looks like those predictions are translating into real votes. Um, did, did Labor have the right tactic, do you think, to go so hard so personally after Pauline Hanson when you need a lot of her people to disregard her advice and give their preferences to Labor? Well, the first thing to say is that uh, if she was serious about the people of Queensland and representing them, she'd be here on the ground talking to them about the issues that matter. Um, I know that, um, you know, things may have been booked, but, hey, that's politics. Things come up. Um, and if you're interested in putting the people of Queensland that you represent first, then that's what you do. You put them first. And here's an opportunity that she's blown. She's off on a, you know, a large cruise around, around Europe when people in Queen... Most Queenslanders wouldn't be able to afford that for first, and they're struggling to make ends meet and they've got an opportunity to have their say on, on the weekend. Uh, the other point to make is that 90% um, you know, of the time, Pauline Hanson will vote with this government in the parliament. And a lot of those issues include cutting uh, penalty rates for workers, um, ensuring that uh, businesses get tax cuts um, and things like that ahead of, ahead of uh, workers. These are issues that are key to peop in people's minds when they're voting on Saturday. And on all of those, Pauline Hanson's voted with the government rather than with the battlers of Queensland. The other point to make is mm. that a lot of these voters, I think, Peter, will be people that we're seeing increasingly when we're on polling booths who go in and don't take a how to vote. Um, you know, they might be jacked off with, with politics um, and the state of it in Australia. They don't take a how to vote. They do their own thing. So I, can't, I don't think you can just say that uh, all of them are going to, if they do vote One Nation, vote for the Liberal Party no, as their second that. preference. No, I didn't say that. And if you look at the research out of the last 2016 race, Matt Thistlewaite, it went 56% to the Liberal Party. Um, sorry, the preferences of uh, One Nation went 56% to the Labor Party and not to the Liberal Party. They break about 50-50 and it depends on the seat. I looked at the state results out of <coughs> Queensland. This idea that Pauline Hanson directs her preferences uh, cleanly to any party is wrong. In fact, the only one that really does that so well is the Greens, in that their preferences mm. go in 90% terms uh, to the Labor Party. So it's all very different oh, no. uh, seat by seat. Now, James Patterson, before we go to a break, uh, I'm interested. You worked with Georgina Downer. I rate her intellect. I think she's a, a, she's a very smart and capable uh, political player. Why isn't she really translating into a home territory of Mayo. It looks like she's going to be walloped. Like you, Peter, I rate Georgina Downer very highly. She's a first-class intellect and I think she's run a, a great campaign. And In fact, I'm heading to Mayo on Friday to support the campaign and I'll be there on Saturday on polling day handing out how to vote cards for her. Um, uh, the truth is, Peter, I think you would know that uh, once independent candidates uh, get in, they are very hard to dislodge, short of making Julie Gillard Prime Minister, as uh, three men famously did um, in, in recent years, and they were punished for that. It's actually very hard to dislodge them because uh, an independent has to make no no tough decisions. Uh, an independent has to make no trade-offs. Uh, they never have to say no to anyone in their electorate and, and in their constituency. Uh, they just get to say yes all the time and they get to blame other people when things uh, don't work out. So they can launch fanciful plans and unrealistic policies and never be blamed for their lack of success. And th that's why it is really difficult. It's also difficult when you've got the Labor Party and the Greens running and preferencing uh, Rebecca Sharkey. Basically, for the Liberal Party to win under those circumstances, we have to get 50% of the primary vote. All right, we'll leave it there. We'll take a break and we'll come back shortly after the break with my viewer questions and you'll all have a chance to have your say yet again. Stay with us. You're watching Bradley on Australia's News Channel.
Welcome back. Still with me on the panel is political panel is Jonathan Dunningham, Matt Thistlewaite and James Patterson. This is your questions. Question time now from my viewers. I want to start with Chris. He's a farmer who wrote to me uh, a really thoughtful uh, response, uh, questions about the environment but also questions uh, about immigration. Why isn't there any discussion taking place about the linkage between population size and global emissions? I've been in the beef cattle business all my life and there's no doubt the paddocks are overstocked. Surely if it's the effect that the human species is changing our climate, then surely the size of our population is directly linked. Uh, he's also an environmentalist. This guy has planted uh, tens of thousands of trees across his properties. Um, James Patterson, if we are saying that there's human intervention, the humans have made an impact on climate change, then having too many humans or growing humans in particular places like Australia, when we're going to really battle uh, to cut our emissions, if you look at the government's modelling, your government's modelling out today, then surely we should be having a reasonable debate about population size. Well, I think we need to very clearly and carefully distinguish between Australia's population and our impact on the environment and global population and its potential impact on the environment. Um, uh, Australia, there are good reasons to control the rate of immigration into Australia that, have, that are connected to environment but also have nothing to do with environment. And if global warming is a global problem, uh, then Australia shutting its borders uh, and those people living elsewhere is not going to make any difference to global emissions. Mm -hmm. I have to say I'm pretty sceptical about those people who suggest that we need to control the global human population because there's a very dark history of people who've said that that's something we need to do. I mean, most famously in 1972, the Club of Rome uh, published uh, the, the infamous The Limits of Growth, and they were very eminent scientists who said that they'd calculated the maximum capacity the globe could have host of the number of human beings and they said if we pass that magical number then uh, disaster would uh, would befall the earth now every prediction that they made was wrong uh, the increase in glo global population over the last 40 years has been an overwhelmingly positive thing uh, as the global population has increased our living standards have increased actually environmental degradation has largely declined in the western world um, all the predictions they made were wrong so I'm very skeptical of these global population uh, desires to control. okay we'll just then quickly to John O'Donnell Senator Dunningham, your government today in its national energy guarantee modelling, and I spoke about this at the top of the show, uh, it predicts that to meet the 26% reduction that you say you will meet, that we'll have to reduce our agricultural herd, and we're talking about 3 million beef cattle, uh, nearly 300,000 fewer dairy cows, uh, 270,000 fewer pigs, 8 million a fewer sheep because agricultural emissions, uh, there's very few ways you can have low cost abatement. Uh, electricity is a little bit different, fugitive emissions out of mining are a little bit different, but agriculture, we can't possibly go down the path of cutting our herd sizes. We've got a growing population, high immigration. What are we going to eat and what are we going to export? Uh, spot on. Look, I did see that reporting and I have to confess uh, that is something that does concern me now. Uh, I don't know on the pathway through to uh, finally settling on an energy policy uh, what movement there will be between different industries, different sectors, agriculture versus electricity versus mining versus manufacturing. But in Tasmania, for instance, um, the Hodgman government is committed to growing the agricultural industry, the primary industry sector, tenfold. Um, and so to hear reports like that, where if we're to uh, meet emissions reduction targets, we're going to have to reduce uh, what is a key economic contributor to regional communities right across the country. That's something to be concerned about. So I personally uh, am aghast at the idea and it's something I'll be uh, looking at very closely as we move forward. OK, Matt, this way it doesn't seem like the left hand knows what the right hand's doing. And the answer that everyone gives to me, which I'm going to raise this with Labor, is well, they'll be so much worse. Now, you have a worse policy. If you look at uh, the renewable target Labor's got, it's basically double what the Coalition's got. But none of these are any good for the country. Well, Peter, if we had have left Labor's policy in place of um, the uh, carbon price, we were making the that tax. smooth, Sorry, the that smooth transition to the a tax. clean energy future where we would have been reducing our emissions but investing more in uh, renewable energy. Under our policy, we specifically exempted agriculture and the transport industry. So That's there true, would be no did. talk of reducing herd sizes that we're currently having at the moment because we, because we saw that as an economic impact that could harm Australia and therefore we specifically exempted those industries but we put in place the mechanisms to ensure that there was a smooth transition 
um, gradually reducing the dependence on coal-fired power moving to gas and then renewable sources at the same time compensating households to ensure that they weren't impacted in a dramatic effect. We were making that smooth transition and unfortunately when the Abbott Turnbull government was elected they stopped that. We're now all paying the price well, for on, that through higher electricity prices, It wasn't unfortunately. What happened, Matt Thistlewaite, let's, let's be very clear here. In 2013, you lost a landslide election where the question at the ballot box is, do you want a carbon tax? Vote for Kevin Rudd, Mark II. Or do you not want a carbon tax? Vote for Tony Abbott. So there's a little thing called democracy that meant your carbon tax bit the dust. And I think if you ask the question again, people would have the same view, uh, probably even worse. I want to go to a question, and this will go to you straight away, Matt. Um, Peter from Queensland, and this is a big issue for you, I know, in New South Wales, but why don't we have a crisis fund for our farmers? What are we doing to protect the food bowl of Australia? Stop international funding and renewable subsidies immediately and distribute the funds to save our farmers, or are we preparing for kangaroo meat diets? I tell you, the big issue right across the eastern seaboard is drought. It's got to be a worry for you in New South Wales. Yeah, it certainly is. Uh, it's it's a, a big worry. Um, it's getting to drastic situations. Uh, a lot of farmers are really, really struggling. Um, I'm in a city seat and I'm starting to get emails from constituents in my area that are concerned and have got a lot of sympathy um, for Do farmers. Do you support a crisis Look, the, fund? The, well, there are, there are funds that, that are available. Um, there's concessional loans um, and there are emergency funds, I understand, that farmers can access. But I, I think that the problem has been... Peter, that um, the, the details and the complications that people have to go through in terms of filling out the forms and applying for but they don't these want funds more are so debt, complicated Matt. that people, people don't even bother. Um, and that's something that the government really does need to look at because some of these funds have been available but there's been very, very low take-up rates and the government's been doing a, a listening tour, they've been saying, but there's been no action. They seem to be all talk and, and no action at the moment on this and farmers are struggling. James Patterson, farmers are saying they don't want more debt. Uh, what we're talking about in terms of welfare payments uh, is money just to put a little bit of food on the table. Uh, what's been scrapped uh, mostly at the state level has been subsidies, money to move uh, hay and other fodder uh, to feed starving animals. Uh, what's got to happen here? Well, Peter, the Productivity Commission did a review a couple of years ago about what is the most effective way and cost-effective way to provide uh, assistance to farmers in drought. And what they pointed to is that generally the evidence shows that income contingent loans that do have to be paid back are the best way of ensuring farmers who in the long term are viable operators and can sustain in a variable climate are the ones that stay on the land and can get through these um, spells that are awful to deal with but have great long term prospects. Because mm -hmm. what you don't actually want to do is encourage people to stay on the land who are not James viable Patterson, in a climate that is variable. I grew up in the Mallee. We carted water when I was a kid in drought. I reckon you would get probably lynched in town if you went up and quoted the Productivity Commission to a whole lot of farmers who were doing it tough. Well, that might be right, Peter, but that doesn't stop it being true. And actually, a lot of farmers that I talk to are very proud of the fact that they are not reliant on government support, except in the most extreme circumstances. Well, Everybody I think you have with extreme circumstance now. You've got almost 60% of uh, Queensland in drought. You've got nearly 55% of New South Wales in drought. I don't reckon it gets any more extreme than that. Anyway, I'm getting someone well, in my ear. that's why there is support. There is not support, mate. There is a drought debt loan facility, there is welfare to farmers and what they're asking for is a return of the subsidies. But we'll have a better talk about drought and the government's response next time around. I'm sorry to leave it there, but we've run out of time. Thank you very much, Matt Thistleway, James Patterson and John O'Donnell.